this is why we pay that guy the big bucks. That's right. Yeah. I, I know, right? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, First Church in Sterling. Oh, my goodness. I have been gone for what seems like three months, but I think it was only three weeks. <laughs> or two weeks. I don't even think it was. Yeah, I think it was only two weeks. Oh, well. It feels to me like I was gone forever. I'm back. I was on vacation. Yay. And I missed you all. Um, welcome. Welcome to the First Church in Sterling, where we are still gathered in the spirit of Jesus and committed to creating heaven on earth. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to everyone who is joining us for the first time. Welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live. Are you still out there, Facebook Live? If you're still there, will you say hi to us in the comments section? Just let us know that we're, we're still doing this for a good reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> and welcome to everyone who is here with us in this outdoor sanctuary on our town common. Welcome to all who need a church home and to all who call this church home already. Welcome to people from all towns and cities and states and countries. Welcome to all who want to follow Christ, who have doubts, who do not believe. Welcome to people of all ages, races, nationalities, abilities, sexualities, and gender expressions. Welcome to single, to partnered, to widowed, to married people. Welcome to believers. Welcome to questioners. Welcome to questioning believers. Welcome to everyone. We welcome you to come as you are and to meet this God who challenges us to be more than we think we can be. We welcome you if you are not perfect, because certainly neither are we, and we know that at times the church has denied God's promise for itself and for others, and... Uh, which is why we say, <laughs> even, I'm not perfect. I forget the thing that I say every week for the last six. Yeah, I know. I know what I'm supposed to say. I just, I'm just reveling in the fact that God loves me even though I'm imperfect. But that's why we say without reservation <laughs> that you are welcome here just as God welcomes you as a beloved, perfectly imperfect child. We are especially delighted to see you here if this is your first time with us, and we would love to get to know more about you. So if you're watching online, please say hi in the comments section. Tell us where you're watching us from. And if you're here in person, um, we want to get to know you. We have cookies. We have cookies and juice for after church if you want to stick around and talk to us. We're a small group today. We're not usually quite this small, but we are so invested in getting to know you and we would love for you to come and join us for cookies and juice and get to know these intrepid people who are here despite the delta variant on the comment right and if you want a woof yeah i think that's probably why there aren't more people here today um if you want to be added to our mailing list please go to our website www.fcsterling.org and you can sign up there you can learn more about what we're doing, what we're about, and how to be in touch with us. Um, so speaking of the Delta variant, we have in, indeed been reading the news. Um, uh, it, was, it was hard to come back from vacation today because I was on a, a, an island, Star Island, where I go uh, every year, and wh which was shut down last summer because of COVID. So it was such a revelation to be there. Um, and. Uh, uh, a uh, hundred percent of the island was vaccinated so I felt like I was leaving vaccine island to come home to this new yet again this new discussion about COVID-19 and how it is spreading um, so I wanted to just assure you that the church leadership is indeed talking about this we're gonna remain outside when we can um, for the rest of August um, we are taking very seriously the CDC recommendation about masks, um, but we are still in an area that is in the yellow 
Um, so we are still following CDC recommendations. Of course, you are always welcome and encouraged to wear a mask if you feel more comfortable doing so, um, indoors and outdoors. And we'll just continue to monitor the situation and we, we promise that we will change when, when we need to change, okay? And please be in conversation with us um, because we care about what you think. Um, it's also really important to know that in our sanctuary, we have this incredible state-of-the-art air filtration system that we bought in order to have the remote learning center here. And it, it really does work. Um, so that's really important to note. Um, and please tell your friends that that's true. Um, and also, it's important to note that vaccination works. It really does work. So all those people in Provincetown that got COVID-19, even though they were vaccinated, which 75% of them did, they didn't go to the hospital and they didn't die. And we do not want you to go to the hospital and we definitely don't want you to die. So get vaccinated, please tell your friends. It is absolutely what Jesus would do and it will end this pandemic. Okay, blessing of the backpacks. Yay! It's August 29th because our kids, we do believe, will be going back to school this year. <laughs> yes, Lord! <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, so we'll bless the backpacks of our children um, and the laptops and the, uh, the teachers. We'll bless everything before they go back to school on August 29th, so mark your calendars for that. And Zach has a quick announcement that he would like to make as well. Food is Love needs two drivers this coming Monday at 4 p.m to deliver meals to people unable to pick them up for themselves. To volunteer, please go online to our sign up tool or see Jarita, Jarita raise your hand, or see Jarita after service today and you can get signed up for that. Thank you. Food is love, we love you. They have given out, uh, what, 25,000 meals over the course of this pandemic. So there was nothing good about the COVID-19 pandemic, but a lot of good things came out of the COVID-19 pandemic, most notably the incredible love and service of this church community and this small town. Hooray. And now we deepen into worship by saying together our affirmation of faith, which is printed in your bulletins. In the love of truth and the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of humankind. Uh, church, for today's call to worship, we're gonna do a paperless singing song. And by a uh, just chance, uh, happenstance, uh, uh, two members of, of Simple Church Grafton are here with their Yay! lovely children. This is Jim and Deb, you can say hi to them. They're a great, beautiful family, but uh, we wrote this song in that community. And so it's a beautiful serendipitous thing that they're they're here today to sing it with us. So this is once again a call and response hymn. So when I kind of lean back, that's when I'm teaching you what to sing. And then when I lean forward, that's when you sing it back. Okay, so it's really simple. Um, but I'll invite you to make a soft fist with your, with your hand and place it over your heart. And this is going to be our percussion. It's just going to be a gentle pat against your chest. See how it makes that kind of bass drum sound. And then... Uh, this is going to be our key. It's just uh, go ahead and hum this along with me. And when you're not singing, you can hit back on that drone if you want. It sounds really cool. Okay? So here we go. Love long, love well. Love long, love well. Wherever you go. Wherever. Love long, love well. Love long, love well. Wherever you go, wherever you go, and wherever you see, and wherever you see, let oppress go free. Let oppress go free. Love long, love well. Love long, love well. Wherever you go, 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 wherever you go. 
please won't you rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And please, won't you join me in a time of confession? God, we have been clumsy in our relationships with each other and with you, and we have separated ourselves from each other and from you. And so we confess now the sins of our communities. We confess that we have hardened hearts. It has been far too easily easy to socially distance during this time because social distance is our default mode, O oh God. And we have been unkind and unforgiving and unmovable. We have cast people out of our circle far too easily. We have made our love conditional we have demanded purity of belief and purity of practice. And God, we are sorry and we humbly repent. We know you created us in your image and for your glory, but we are only human and doing the best that we can. In the silence now, we lift up our individual confessions to you.
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Beloved, please won't you rise and hear this good news. Rise up. Rise up in body or in spirit. You have to be up to hear this good news. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much you have socially distanced yourself from each other because you can never be distanced from God. And God makes all of us one human family, so we can never actually be distanced from one another. We are all wrapped up in each other and in our God because there is nothing, nothing in heaven and nothing on earth that can separate us from the love of God. And so I declare us a forgiven people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. And now may the peace of God be always with you. Thank you. Please turn and greet one another with signs of Christ's peace. And please turn and greet one another in the comments section on Facebook with signs of Christ's peace as well. Peace be with you. Today's uh, reading from the gospel is from uh, Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses 21 through 28. I'm reading from the Zach Kersey Standard Edition. <laughs> and having gone forth from there, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the same region approached him and was crying out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is wretchedly possessed by a demon. And he did not answer her, not even a word. And his disciples came to him and implored him, saying, Dismiss her, for she cries out with us. And answering, he said, Why was I sent, if not for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? But having come, she was worshiping him, saying, Lord, help me. And answering, he said, It isn't right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Certainly, Lord, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs falling from their master's table. Then answering, Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. What you desire will come to pass. And her daughter was helped, was healed from that hour. But the church here with the Spirit is saying, God, God is, is still, still speaking. speaking. Feel 
Amen. I asked Kate and Joel to play a uh, girl power song, and that's the one they came up with. So, way to go! What a good, what a great one to to sing. Natural woman. All right. Um, before I pray and before I preach, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, today is the one year anniversary of me preaching here when I was invited to apply for the job uh, of associate pastor. So, full circle, one year. What a great year it's been. And how much things have changed. Oh, my goodness. How things have changed uh, in just one year um, and how things have stayed the same. I mean, I still love preaching here. I still love this community, and I still love worshiping with you all in the common. And it's just, a, yeah, here we are. Ain't going nowhere, baby. All right, here we go. All right, let's pray. God, please let us hear your still small voice this morning in this sanctuary of the open sky and the choir of the birds and the motorcycles. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship and to think through uh, what it means to be a person of spirit, a spiritual person in the world today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I watched an incredible documentary on the New York Times. Uh, they do these short documentaries of about 15 minutes long. And uh, this came up on Monday morning uh, as this, this story, and it was so perfect, this story, that I texted Robin, hey, would you mind if I, I preached this, this week? Um, because this story is just too good to, to pass up. Um, Robin's also coming back from vacation, and we're so glad to have her back. Let's give her a round of applause and welcome. So this morning's story, almost like a modern parable, is about a woman named Jocelyn Bell, and when Jocelyn was a young girl living in Northern Ireland, she went to a, a school that was for boys and girls. But during the science and math time, all of the girls in Jocelyn's class, this would have been in the 1950s, 
were pulled out of the school and were taken to be taught domestic skills. So they didn't want to um, teach the girls math and science because they assumed they would be homemakers. So they taught them how to sew and cook. And young Jocelyn was very offended at this. She was raised in a Quaker household, which taught that men and women were equals in the face of God, and that women bore the image of God exactly the same as men. Amen. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. And so she told her father that she had been taken out of class to do home economics, and her father marched to the school, went to the headmaster, and demanded that any young girl that wanted to go to math and science should be allowed to. And so from that day forward, Jocelyn and two other classmates who were young girls began going to the math and science classes at her school. And while she did this, she fell in love with astronomy. On her father's library shelf, there was a book that was a primer, an introduction to astrophysics and astronomy by a man named uh, Dr. Fred Hoyle, who was a Cambridge scientist. And she was impressed by the scope and the magnitude and the unknowability of the universe. But she was inspired by the way that using math and using science, we could come to know the great mysteries of the cosmos. And she decided that she wanted to be an astronomer, just like Fred Hoyle. She graduated from her um, high school and went on to the University of Glasgow where she studied astrophysics. And her marks were so good that when she applied to the University of Cambridge, she got in and she got a full scholarship. And when she received the, the letter of acceptance, she thought, surely this must be a mistake. Because in the 60s, not many women were admitted to Cambridge. She was one of just a couple in her incoming class. And she was just convinced that if they truly found out who she really was, that they would kick her out. So she decided that she was going to try her very hardest so that when they inevitably realized their mistake, she could say to herself, I tried my best. And even though like, she knew they were going to kick her out, um, she could go to bed with a clean conscience. They didn't kick her out, but they didn't make it easy on her either. Every time she walked into one of the large lecture halls, the men, the primarily men classroom, would stand and beat on their desks and whistle at her and catcall her until she sat down. And every day she had to endure that shame and embarrassment, people pointing out the fact that she was different. But she persevered. And she distinguished herself until her um, doctoral studies where um, she participated in the building of an enormous radio telescope called the Interplanetary Scantillion Array. And what this was, it took her two years to build it. They look a lot like these um, electrical lines here. And they ran over about two acres of land, and it was something like 60 miles of cable a run across this square plot of land outside of the university. And they used this radio telescope to see things in the universe that you couldn't see with the naked eye or even through a telescope. In the 1960s, this was around 1967, quasars had just been discovered and they were all the rage for studies in astronomy. Quasars, as we all know, but I'll, uh, I'll remind us just in case we forgot. Quasars are supermassive black holes that are millions and even billions of the, uh, times the mass of our own sun. And they are surrounded by a disk of gaseous material called an accretion disk that shoot out enormous electromagnetic radiation as the cloud of the accretion disk gets sucked into the, the, um, the unknowable black hole that shoots out electromagnetic radiation that can be picked up by a radio telescope. So they were looking for quasars and they found quasars, but the way that it worked was they would have this reading interference radio signals and paper would feed through a machine and a needle, a lot like a seismograph. You guys ever seen seismographs in the movies? It would move up and down on the paper. And one day in 1967, Jocelyn was reading the miles and miles of paper that she had to go through um, each week as, as the, the primary um, doctoral student on this project. She noticed an irregularity. 
there was a pulse that went out in regular intervals along the paper. And it was not supposed to be there. It was puzzling to her. So she called up her supervisor on the project, uh, a man named Dr. Hewish. And she said, I have an irregularity on um, the seismograph reading, and I'd like for you to look at it. She described it to him. His response was, it's operator error. Go back and do it again. So she went back and did it again. And right there, right where she expected it to be, right where it was before, there was another irregular pulsing on the radio reading. So she calls him again. She saw it again. She said, this isn't a mistake in the telescope. Um, this isn't man-made. Would you come and look at it? And he said, no. You messed up when you built the telescope. Go back and check the miles and miles of cable to make sure that you didn't make a mistake. So she did. She went back, she checked everything, she ran it again, she enlarged the reading so that you could see it more clearly, and there again was this pulsing irregularity in deep space. And finally, she begged her professor Hewish to come and look. She was accused of being shrill and nagging. Any women in the audience ever, in the face of your persistence, been called nagging or shrill? But she showed Hewish, and as the moment he saw it, he knew that this was indeed something to pay attention to. Just a short time later, they called a conference, and all of the major astrophysicists from around the world came to Cambridge to discuss these pulsing things that they had found in space. They decided that you can't just have one. If you have one, then people could say that something's wrong. So they had to find another, and guess what? She found another. You know why? Because she looked for it this time. And she named it as well. She named it a pulsar because of the pulsing irregularity that they saw. But they still had no idea what this was. So who shows up to this conference at Cambridge other than Dr. Fred Hoyle, who initially inspired her to become an astrophysicist in the first place? At this point, he's um, aged and no longer working in the same capacity. But the moment he hears their presentation on this pulsar in space, he knew exactly what it was. He stood up and he said, I believe this to be a supernova that has collapsed in on itself, and it shoots out gravitational forces from the outside of this black hole that's created, and it spins at incredible speeds. And when the gravitational um, forces are pointing at you, you get this blip on your radio telescope, and that's why it's regular. It spins like a clock. And they, they, that ended up being true. That's what pulsars are. And we've now found thousands of them in the universe. Shortly after that, she walked in, Jocelyn walked in on her professor Hewish and another professor having a conversation. And she realized very quickly that she should have been invited to this meeting, but she was not. She walked in on something she was not supposed to see. And they were discussing publication. She advocated for herself and of the five people who were listed on that paper, she was listed second, behind her professor, despite the fact that she was the one who discovered it, named it, found a second, and had persisted so that her professor would admit that this was something that was real. But she got her name on the paper. She felt like that was a good enough contribution to science. Her name would be remembered, and she, she moved on. This made a big splash in the papers. People would come and interview this team about pulsars, because quasars were still very much in the news. And they would ask Professor Hewish about what pulsars were. And when it came to Jocelyn, they would ask her what were called human interest questions. They would ask her her height and her weight, her measurements. They would ask her if she was married, if she intended to be married. Would you say that your hair is blonde, or would you say that your hair is brunette? These were the type of questions that Jocelyn were given. And to Professor Hewish, they would ask the important cosmological or even philosophical questions about this finding. She ended up getting married, as was expected of her, in the, the late 60s. And when her husband was moved to another part of um, the island of, of Great Britain for, her, for his job as, as a government official, she moved with him, left Cambridge, as she was expected to. But she continued working as an astrophysicist. And as she was um, continuing her PhD studies and finishing up 
A secretary walked into the room, this is several years later in 1974, and said, have you heard the news? They've awarded the Nobel Prize to the person who discovered the pulsar. And her heart sank. They had awarded the Nobel Prize to her professor and not her. And the professor accepted the award without insisting that she receive the prize as well. Oh, the injustice. The injustice. I always get emotional at this part in the story. How unfair it was that sh her contribution to science and knowledge was not, not appreciated, but instead someone who did not work as hard got the award simply because he was male. One person came to her, to her side publicly when the award was given, none other than Fred Hoyle, the astrophysicist that inspired her when she was a young child. And he said of Dr. Hewish, you stole that young woman's research, you stole her contributions, and you stole um, her, her, ultimately her observations. She deserved the award, and you didn't. Even though Dr. Hoyle went on to continue having an illustrious career, um, he also never received the Nobel Prize, even though he contributed to many things, many projects that eventually received the Nobel Prize, the reason being that he stood up for Jocelyn Bell and embarrassed the Nobel Committee. But he was still her only public champion until it was mostly forgotten. Now, what does this have to do with the Bible verse that we read today? The Bible verse that we read today shows a picture of Jesus and his disciples walking in the land of Canaan. Canaan. And Canaanites were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. And this woman comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, son of David, my daughter is wretchedly possessed by a demon. Will you help her? And what did the disciples say? They say, Lord, dismiss her. Send her away. She cries out to us. You can almost hear the whining in their voice. You can almost hear them saying, Lord, send this nagging woman away. Lord, send this shrill woman away. And what is, how does Jesus respond? He goes, hey, fellas, hey, I'm with you, okay? Um, I'm here to save uh, the children of Israel, not these Canaanites. I got you. The woman comes up and pleads again with Jesus, heal my daughter. And then Jesus says, oh, my least favorite saying of Jesus in the entire Bible. He says, woman, does the master throw bread to the dogs? He says, you're not worth my time. Get out of here. You're bothering me. And then the woman responds, yes, but even the dogs receive the scraps from the master's table, saying, yes, God's love is big enough, Jesus, that it's not this limited resource where you give God's love to one people and not another, that if you give love to one person, you have less love to give to another. She changes Jesus' mind. And Jesus says, woman, your faith is so great. Go, and the thing that you've requested will be awarded to you. This is a tough thing to read of Jesus. It's not often that Jesus calls someone a dog. Uh, the harshness in English of calling a woman a dog, I think we all know the word, is one that's often used by, by men to dismiss women, to put them down. I won't say the word out loud. But the awkwardness in English, the harshness in English is also there in Greek. It's the same word. He calls the woman a dog. And it's a tough story to hear, especially if, as we have been conditioned to do, we read the stories of Jesus as Jesus being unable to make a mistake and being unable to change his mind. But if we read the story as Jesus being able to have his mind changed, the tenor of the story changes completely. Biblical scholars often draw a connection between this verse and another beloved verse of the Old Testament wherein 
Moses goes up to the top of the mountain and he's given the Ten Commandments. And while he's gone, the people of Israel make a golden calf and they begin to worship it. And God is so angry that God tells Moses, I will descend this mountain and I will kill everyone in Israel. But Moses stands up to God and says, do not let your anger get in the way of your love for your people. And he argues on behalf of the people of Israel and God's anger cools. Moses stands up even to God for the sake of justice. Even to God, Moses, as the leader of the people, stood up for the people, stood up for justice. In a similar way, this woman called for justice to the face of the Son of God. She said, bring justice to my daughter, bring healing to my daughter. She changed Jesus' mind. Can you imagine a more extreme situation of someone for whom you'd have to argue against? In the Jewish writings of the Talmud, there is a famous saying from a rabbi who says, if the Messiah comes, the Messiah, the long-awaited anointed one who would bring Israel back to overthrow uh, any oppressors to make sight to the blind, to set the captives free. Even if the Messiah comes, this long-awaited thing, if the Messiah comes, you're supposed to drop everything and go to them. It says, if the Messiah comes and you hear the cry of a child, attend first to the cries of the child in need. The ultimate goal of humanity in the Old Testament and the New, is to seek justice even in the face of extreme hardship. When the odds are stacked against you, that's exactly when you should argue for justice, even in the face of God himself, even in the face of Christ. Fast forward almost 40 years. In 2018, Jocelyn Bell, was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize in Physics. This is not the top prize in physics, it's still the Nobel Prize. But people refer to it often now as the new Nobel. She is given a prize in recognition of her contribution to knowledge and science for the discovery of the pulsar. And in 2018, she was given three million dollars attached to this prize to do with it whatever she wanted. And rather than keeping the money or giving it to her own university or using it for her own studies, she called Cambridge University and said, would you accept this $3 million prize in full to set up an endowment to award scholarships to women and minorities for the studies of math and science. Even though she was given this great injustice, this great unfairness of not being awarded the prize that was due to her, she didn't hold a grudge. Instead, she used what she was given to make sure that other people didn't have to go through the same indignities that she did. My question for us this morning, how many voices have gone unheard because they were different? How many children could have grown up to achieve incredible things but were stifled because they were a woman, because they were gay, because of the color of their skin? Who do we not see? Whose voice cries out to justice for us, and we say, shh, be quiet. You're making me uncomfortable. Why would I pay attention to you? I have my own family to worry about. How often do we ignore the cries of others because they make us feel uncomfortable or annoyed? How many voices have been ignored by us, not because we were distracted by the light of the coming Messiah or the cloud of God hanging over the mountain. 
how many were ignored because we are blinded by the light of our own egos or own self-interest or simply because it's not the way that things are done or have been done will we hear the voices that cry out or will we get in our own way but we deny ourselves the advances that could come from the minds of children who are different from people who are different or will we push those voices aside, as is so often done? My prayer is that we will look for the voices that are not heard, that we will elevate the voices that are not given elevation, that we'll hand the microphone to people whose voices are quieted. And if we can do that, I think that the world will be brighter, the knowledge that we have will be greater, and that is our call, not just in the world, but in the church as well. Amen. We'll sing ourselves into a time of prayer now. The morning has broken. Please join us. beg my mother told me don't whine I tell my children be polite the key to civil society and the foreigner approaches the rabbi her need was great her daughter ill her desperation complete she begged she whined she was impolite that was her prayer faith emboldened by need shouting heard healing. Uppity faith and feisty women, annoyance, rewarded, challenge, inspiring. God, hear now your people in shameless, feisty, uppity prayer. If you have a prayer that you would like to feistily pray, please raise your hand and I will come around with the microphone and we will respond to each petition with God in your grace and mercy. Hear our prayer. You don't have to be feisty if you don't want to. That's okay, too. God hears all of our prayers. Jenny. I'd just like prayers for my boss who um, just had brain surgery and hope that he will recover. For Jenny's boss, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. Ooh, Matt. Prayers for my mother, uh, Virginia Denny. Um, 
she had an aneurysm back in May and is, re is recovering now at uh, Spalding in Cambridge. So send your good thoughts and prayers. And for Armand, her husband, to God in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. Betty. Continued prayers for Conrad for healing and for strength and prayers for Jackie to help her through this. Yes, for Conrad Preventure, who fell, and for Jackie, his beloved wife, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. Ah, Pete, you guys are giving me a workout. Um, I'd ask for prayers for a good friend who's going through a tough separation and divorce, and she's really struggling. Um, so just for peace and some healing for her. So for Pete's friend and for all who are struggling through broken relationships and divorce, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. To these petitions, we add this prayer. God, because you reward the faith of shameless women and men, we know that we deserve more than the scraps of food under the table meant for the dogs. And so I demand that you open our eyes so that together we can end this pandemic. Give us courage that puts flight to all of our fears to take life-saving vaccines that will eradicate this disease. Give us the courage to end the cold civil war we are fighting on the internet and at school committee meetings and with flags on our houses. Help us to cease watching fake news and instead to bring the good news of the gospel to one another. And that news is love. Help us to see that we are being played by like a fiddle by those who know that our anger and separation keeps Rome in business and keeps us sick and dying. And help us to love one another by remembering that we are all your children and that when one part of the body is ill, the entire body is ill. When one part of the body is flourishing, the entire body flourishes. In the silence now, we lift up our prayers to you. And we pray this shameless prayer for love's sake. Amen. Beloved, now we enter into the time of offering. There's more than one way to give as the ushers uh, prepare to pass the, the baskets this morning. You can give the old-fashioned way with a, with a check or cash, um, or you can also use the QR code in the back of the bulletin using the camera app on your phone, and that will take you directly to our giving page online. You can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. It's just like the way that you pay uh, Disney Plus. It comes out of your bill automatically. Um, you can set up a recurring donation, set it and forget it. Um, I'll invite you to go home and sit down with your budgets uh, to see how much you and your family could afford to give to the important work of the church, which goes not just to pay the salaries of the staff, the maintaining of our building, but also the many ministries that we do both locally and throughout the world. So I'll invite you now to give and give generously. Some people think you're distant, just some words on a page. That you're nothing more than fables handed down along the way. But I've seen you part the waters when no one else could pull me from the deep. That's who you are to me. Some people think you just live in cathedrals made of stone. But I know you live inside my heart I know that it's your home And I've seen you in a sun 
set and in the eyes of a stranger on the street that's who you are to me you're amazing faithful love's open door when i'm empty you fill me with hunger for more of your mercy your goodness lord you're the end that everybody does and I wonder when I stumble am I still worthy of your love but I know that I get stronger when I'm talking to you down on my knees you're everything I need you're amazing faithful love's open door when I'm empty you fill me with hunger for more Lord, you the air that I breathe. That's who you are to me. Who you are to me. You're forever holy. You're the Lamb who is givers. Praise God for all that love has done. Praise God for these gifts. Praise God most especially for these givers. May we use all of it to create heaven on earth. Amen. You may be seated. People of God, let us come now to the table of hope where the risen Christ is still our host and where we are still the beloved guests. All are welcome at this table. All, all who seek comfort, community, love, and all who dare to hope that God's kingdom of love and justice is on this earth despite evidence to the contrary. This table is for all, young and old, baptized or not, confirmed or not, a member here or not, because Jesus has room for all of humanity at his welcome table of peace and of justice. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to, God, to the love of God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. 
Let us pray. God, you taught us that we are worth more than the scraps beneath the table, and you invite us this once over this one overflowing with your grace. Help us to wake up to ourselves and to you. Set us free from the illusion of trying to be perfect so that we might be more fully human. Help us not to chase after an imaginary life and to find satisfaction in our real lives. Turn us away from self-rejection so we might see that your arms are open and welcome to this table and to this feast. We rejoice in your gifts, which are ours, God and community, holy and one. We pray this as we were taught. Our, Our Father, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered his friends around a simple table and had a simple meal of bread and wine. And he took bread and he blessed it, giving thanks to God. And he broke it. <laughs> and I he forgot to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay because I'm strong. I'm a, I'm a courageous woman strong like bull, right? <laughs> a natural woman. And Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his friends, to his disciples. And he said to them, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. When supper was over, he poured wine And he lifted it up in common cup, giving thanks to God. And he said to his friends who were gathered around the table, take, drink, this is my life poured out for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. Please won't you hold out your hands to bless the elements. Come, Holy Spirit, bless this bread so that it might sustain our faith and help us to know that there is always enough for all. And bless this fruit of the vine so that it might quench our thirst for justice. Amen. Beloved, I really meant it when I said that this table is for all because we're not here to tell you who God welcomes at this table. God is. This is not our table. This is God's table, which means that all of humanity is welcome here. It doesn't matter if you don't know what this is about, or uh, if you are baptized or not baptized, or if you're a part of this church you just got here today. If you um, are not even sure why you're coming to this table, you just know that you feel like you belong here. This table is for you. It's for all of you. It's for people you don't like. It's for people who you love. It's for people that are different. It's for people who are often turned away from other tables. It is for persistent women. It is for courageous men. It is for people all across the gender spectrum that don't fit into the category of women and man. This table is for all. We mean that all. And this is grape juice. It is not wine. This is gluten-free bread. There are no barriers to this table. In a moment, the deacons will come and serve you bread, and together we'll eat it, and then they will come and serve you grape juice, and together we will drink it. This is the table of God for the people of God, and we are all the people of God. Come, for everything is ready.
This is the bread of life. the cup of hope. Okay, thanks. Thanks be to you, O oh God, for your presence and your purpose for our ability to find you in the ordinary stuff of life, in bread and in wine, for spirit is in all things. May, May the, the blessings, blessings of this table strengthen our faith, faith help us to learn more generous, generous lives, and love, love one another, another. For we, we pray in the name, name of Jesus, who embodies love. love. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in our final hymn, I Surrender All.
Beloved, in closing here, this benediction. May you leave this place with ears that are opened to the cries of those that are unheard. May we listen to those who are on the margins and celebrate the diversity of thought that expands our knowledge of the world, expands our understanding of who God made us to be. Go in peace. Amen.